Turn to Genesis 50. We looked at Genesis 15, the covenant that God made with Abraham. Genesis 22, Abraham was told to offer up Isaac, his son, his only son, whom he loved. And now this morning, we're going to look at the life of Joseph, which is really chapters 37 through 50, the life of Joseph. So what we're going to see this morning, I think, is just so crucial and foundational to the Christian life. I'm calling it the key that unlocks the door to godly living. I I believe that getting your hands on this is really the key to living a godly life. If you do not understand this, it will sink you. And so the truth that we will look at as a key to whether you grow old and become crusty and bitter and full of disappointments, or whether you'll be a saint full of joy and hope and gratitude useful for the Master. I'm quite certain that there are none here who have been a stranger to difficult times, uh, to adversity, to broken dreams, and to deep disappointments. There are many who have been hurt by human beings who are very near and dear to them. Some of you I've heard testimony of of how hurt you were by a parent. Some of you have been hurt greatly uh, by a spouse, some by children, some by a friend or a coach or a teacher. Uh, Is anyone exempt? Maybe just raise your hand. Uh, If you've never had that, we'll come give you a Snuggie. (laughs) We'll actually pray for you because it will come. Yet, how we respond to these instances and circumstances are really what make us peculiarly Christian. I've pastored for well over 25 years now, and I've watched different responses to these events as God brings them into our lives. I've watched these kind of hurts own a soul really for the rest of your days. It, It takes root, and it just seems to never come out. Uh, You'll say, we're fine. I've got this. I can get through it. And 10 years later, you'll be on a therapist's couch. You become bitter, maybe a time bomb, critical, pessimistic. Uh, The events of your life truly define who you are. It's, it owns you. Um, And then yet I've seen others that no matter what comes into your life, no matter how hard, how intense, how hurtful, or even how long The sweet, joyful fruit just seems to keep coming up. It just hangs on your vines. People who once loved you will hurt you. And people who who you've laid your life out will slander you behind your back. And so I ask you, do you have a blacklist? Do you look for revenge? Do you give a fake forgiveness and just avoid these kind of people the rest of your life and get a knot in your stomach every time you hear their name? Is that how you deal with these things? Is this how we are to handle it? Elton Hubber, a professor of theology, said, we must endure contemptuous treatment without resentment. And we need to be a a people then who are characterized uh, by this sweet fruit of forgiveness and being able to trust the hand of God as he shapes and molds our lives. So the question then is, how do we then overcome evil with good? We love these principles and, you know, I can teach them forever until they come to your front door. How do we love our enemies and pray for those who mistreat us? How do we overcome the crippling paralysis of resentment and bitterness? Well, this morning, Joseph is going to teach us this in a very powerful way. He was the one who was acquainted with grief. He was one who was betrayed by his own family, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, spends long years in prison. He's forgotten in prison by the cupbearer. Yet we will see his response this morning and his thoughts as he assesses his life. He's going to open up the lid of his heart in Genesis 50 and just tell us how does he think about life and all the hardships that fell upon him. He's going to let us come right into his room and understand his thinking. How he is pouring out grace and love upon those who hurt him so deeply. His response and heart, I think, are absolutely beautiful in this story. I heard an illustration this week about the beauty of trees. When you look at trees and their leaves, they they drink in the poisons of the world, carbon monoxide and toxins and all of the like. But what you see is they don't return the kind. They they transform the toxins and they give back life-producing oxygen called photosynthesis. And what I want for us as a church is I want to be like that. I want to be like Joseph, and ultimately be like Christ. So let's go before the throne of grace, and may we become these kind of men, women, and children who will advance the kingdom of God and put on display the grace of God 
in our lives. So let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning and I thank you for the life of Joseph. I thank you for what we can learn from it. So I pray that your spirit would be the teacher. God, that you would take these words and, and teach our hearts. If any have come in here with that crippling uh, bitterness or something in life that has defined them by a deep, deep hurt that they just can't get over. God, I would ask that by your grace, you would give deliverance this morning. Lord, that you would move through your word by your spirit and you would illuminate minds and hearts and that we would be those who would be characterized by the sweet forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, do this work in us in our midst, we pray. Amen. Turn to Genesis 50. I want to read verses 15 through 17. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? And so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And so just out of the gate is why did the brothers write such a letter to Joseph? And then why is Joseph crying in our verses here this morning? And what we need to do is set a context. And so um, stay awake. I got to set kind of a long context and there's a beautiful fruit at the end of it. So work with me, okay? In Genesis 37, we meet a very young Joseph. He was born to Jacob, who had 12 sons, but two were born to Jacob's favorite wife. It's a long story about Rachel. And so Jason, uh, Joseph was the favored son. He, he was spoiled. He was uh, the apple of his eye, of Jacob's eye. He was given the beautiful coat. And listen to Genesis 37.4. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him. It could not speak to him on friendly terms. And this is a very common response by siblings when there's a favored one in the family, and that could be a whole sermon about favoritism within a family and the toxicity and all that came into this family because of it. It poisoned the whole family. I think it poisoned Joseph. Joseph would have these dreams of a stalks of grain and, and they represented his brothers and they would come and bow down to him. And then the stars and all the stars would bow down to him. And he seemed like he was telling the brothers about these dreams. Like, uh, I wonder what that could possibly mean. I, I just think he was a punk. Have you ever met someone really spoiled? It just, it affects you. And I, I think Joseph lorded it over the brothers. I'm not going to be dogmatic. I can't give you the exact verse, but it just, you sense it just a little bit here in the early chapters. One day, the sons are sent out by Jacob to take the sheep to graze. And we learn all about that in Psalm 23, and they go to Shechem. And later he sent Joseph to check on them. So that bothers me right on the gate. Joseph isn't even working. You know, later, Joseph, let's go check on the brothers. And the, it says it just so happened that the brothers went to Dothan a very remote place, and Joseph comes to where the brothers were supposed to be, and they're not there. And it just so happens that he met a stranger who overheard the brothers that said they, they were going to Dothan or he would have never found them. And so Joseph then sets out to find them. And the brothers see Joseph coming, and they say, let's kill him. And so they throw him in a water cistern, and they sit down and they eat. You see how deep the bitterness is? We're going to kill Joseph and let's have lunch first. It just so happens that some Ishmaelites now are traveling by while they're eating their lunch. And Judah says, why should we kill him? Let, let's get something for him. And so they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. And they took his coat and they smeared it with animal's blood. And they come back to Jacob, his dad, and told Jacob that he had been killed by a wild animal. Jacob goes into complete despair with his favorite child, of course. He tears out his hair. He falls to the ground. And his sons just sit and watch it. And it shows you the deep, deep hatred to sit and watch their own dad in that kind of despair and say nothing. Genesis focuses in now on just Joseph's life. He had to deal with the deep hurt of what his brothers did. 
And it really doesn't go well for Joseph. He ends up in a dungeon. He rises out of that, and then Potiphar's wife comes after him, and he flees. And, and he flees, and he's righteous, and he obeyed God and did what was right, and all that came upon him was unjust. He gets falsely accused and goes back into prison. And I just want you to picture that. I was obeying God, being righteous, and the, re the reward is right back into prison. I did everything right, and look at how God treated me. Joseph is in prison for 13 years. And finally, Pharaoh is <coughs> excuse me, having a confusing dream, and it needs to be interpreted, and Joseph is remembered and called up. He interprets the dream, and he tells them this dream that you're having is really, there's going to be seven years of abundance in the land, and then seven years of severe famine will follow it. The need to stockpile then for the first seven years so you will have enough for the other seven. So Joseph is promoted at that time, uh, and he becomes prime minister, so to speak. He's in charge of this whole famine project then of the land in Egypt. But what Joseph did is he saved many lives in the time of that seven-year famine that came upon the land. For Egypt and for many surrounding areas that were coming to buy the grain from Egypt. And so the famine was great in the land, and it was in his family as well with Jacob and his brothers. So Jacob sends his other sons to Egypt to buy the grain, except Benjamin, his new, his other favorite child. And he keeps Benjamin back, and he sends them other, the other sons to get the grain. And listen to what happens when they show up to Egypt, and, and Joseph sees them. It's been 22 years since they sold Joseph into slavery. And Joseph recognizes the brothers, but they don't recognize him. He has to run out of the room and he just weeps so hard he has to wash his face and come back in. And now he, he with the brothers, he's, I don't know if he's trying to see if they repented or, or what he's doing for sure. But he says, who are you? And they tell him. And he says, no, you're not. You're spies. Throw, throw them into prison. And the next day he gets them out and he gives them grain. He says, I need to keep a hostage and it's Simeon. And he says, until you come back, with your brother Benjamin to prove that you're not really lying about who you are, I will keep Simeon. And so they go back and they tell Jacob what the ruler of Egypt had said. And Jacob says, no way, I will not let, let Benjamin go. And he, that's that famous cry. He says, all these things are against me. And I think 15 years ago, I preached a sermon on that. Here it is. All these things are against me. Joseph's dead and now Benjamin. And in the middle of it, the sovereign hand of God is working out something beyond belief. And I think every one of us have had a season of all these things are against me. And the big sovereign picture is so beautiful. Well, after two years of trying to survive the drought, Jacob finally realizes we're all going to die anyway. So what difference does it make? Go back with Benjamin. And when they show up with Benjamin, Joseph runs out of the room again and begins weeping. Joseph says, this is good. Tomorrow you'll feast at my royal table. And then he gives them the grain and they're, they're riding home. <coughs> and Joseph's bodyguards come upon them and said, hey, you stole my master's uh, silver cup. And they, they're sure they didn't. They said, if you find the cup, that one shall die and we will all be your slaves. And they search the bags and they come to the last one, and it's Benjamin's sack, and there they find it. And so they bring him back to Joseph, uh, and, and he says, you don't all have to be my slaves, just the one, I will take Benjamin. And now the brothers can get rid of the other favorite son. So they got rid of Joseph, and there's one more favorite son, and now they could get rid of Benjamin and get their own freedom by doing that. They could all go free. Benjamin is done. This is perfect for these guys. But this time, Judah stands up and he shares what Benjamin means to Jacob. And he says, this will kill our dear father. If this happens to Benjamin, he will die. So he says, let me remain here and let the boy return. So you see that God has been working in Judah's heart and maybe all of the hearts. Joseph breaks and he tells all the court people, leave, leave, go out. And he weeps so loud that the whole palace can hear him weeping and he says to the brothers, I, I am Joseph. How is father doing? How's our father doing? And I just, you dream of situations like these with people who have wronged you, don't you? Sometimes you stay up at night even thinking about this. Wow, I, what, what a chance now for revenge. 
Here they are. He has them. But Joseph says, come closer, draw near. And he shows them in Genesis 45, love and kindness and tells them, I have no grudge against you. I've forgiven you. I see the hand of God in everything now. And so he sends for Jacob and he brings him and all their, their family and belongings to Goshen. And there they live united happily for 17 years. Joseph had taken care of the whole family and he had loved the brothers. All of them had not been working. And there's some verses that share that for 17 years. Now we come to our text this morning and Jacob dies at a ripe old age of 147. There, there weren't factories and GMOs and you know, all that stuff. And he lived to be 147. And they go and they bury him next to his father's. And, and there's that famous saying, it says, beside every grave, there are feelings of guilt. And so the brothers now begin to feel some guilt. And the brothers start to worry. And in verse 15, what if he still has a grudge against us? The guilt and shame rises up. What are they thinking? They're thinking, <clears throat> maybe Joseph spared us so that he wouldn't upset his father if he would have taken us out. And now that he's dead, we're in big trouble. There is no way that he's, gonna, he's not going to wipe us out after what we did to him. There, there's just no way. No one could just forgive such severe treatment and move on like it never happened. He has to have a grudge. He has to have bitterness. It's coming. And so they come up with a plan. And I, I'm almost sure it's a lie. In verse 16, they send a message saying, your father charged us before he died, uh, saying, please, please forgive, I beg you the transgressions of your brothers and their sin. That's self-written. There's just got to be. So what that is saying is, Dad says to be nice to us, Joseph. And Joseph responds in the same love and emotion that have filled his heart throughout. He weeps. And I think he weeps. It doesn't tell us for sure, but because he's forgiven them, he's poured out seven years of love and kindness on them, and they're basically calling him a hypocrite. Is You're faking it, Joseph. You're going to kill us and make me suffer and put us in prison and sell us as slaves. All the kindness I've showed them and there's just suspicion of my motives. I've always wondered how it must grieve the Lord when he's forgiven us and he's been so gracious to us and we still think he's out to get us. That's kind of what the brothers are doing here. Well, why I chose this scripture are the reasons that Joseph is going to give to his brothers He's going he's gonna to give them a couple reasons why they don't need to worry. To completely clear their consciences and calm their fears. And I just think these answers are so beautiful that that's why I wanted to park on it this morning. So thank you for following me on that long review of Genesis with Joseph. Uh, but we're going to look at last week we learned uh, Father Abraham at the end of his life, 120. He was just so seasoned and, and he matured in his faith and he was trusting in the promises of God so well when God said, offer up your son Isaac. Well, now we get to see Joseph and he's standing up on a mountain looking over his life and he's looking at it with the eyes of faith and he's going to give us a gift as the people of God. How do we overcome mistreatment? How do we overcome the betrayal from those who are the very closest to us? How do we overcome the hurt and the harm and the trials of every kind and the injustices? How are we to think about our lives in light of all these things that will come? I guarantee you this was not how Joseph thought about it when he was 17 years old and he was sold into slavery. I guarantee you there had to be some dark times and some wrestlings. It's so hard when you just get these stories and you can't really enter in to how hard that must have been on Joseph. There had to be some deep discouragements there's times when his life made no sense. All I am is imprisoned. I'm a nobody. I have no hope of any future. I'm just locked up. I'm a caged animal that will die in a prison cell and never say goodbye to my mom and my dad and my brother Benjamin. This is being real this morning. How, how do we get through this? How do we not just become bitter, gnarly old saints that get crusty? How do we not become the one who you just kind of feel cheated all the time? You just, life is bad. I just walk around with a, a lament all of my days. I'm sour. I want you to get this. 
I see two kinds of mindsets in the world as I journey. Kind of those who are Pollyanna, just kind of life is good. That, that song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Just no matter what comes, they're just little optimists. And they always walk around that, you know, life's good, life's good, everything's good. They usually just haven't had a lot of hardship yet. Some have it and they still can walk around and just say, life's good. And then there's that other group, life is bad. It's just bad. People are always stabbing you. Anything good in your life, I just wait for the other foot to drop. And all you see is troubles. And so we've kind of got the optimist and we got the pessimist. And I just want you to maybe figure out which one you are. And I can tell you right now, neither is biblical. This is not the answer that Joseph is going to give us. Joseph is going to say life is hard. Because of the fall, there is pain and hurt and betrayal. He'll tell his brothers, you meant it for evil. He's not going to let them up. You, you guys were evil. You meant this to destroy me. But God is good. And he is working everything for our good and his ultimate good and plan and program of what he's doing in this world to exalt his son. So let's look at Joseph's answer to his brothers. He, again, he opens the lid of his heart and he lets us come in and how he's thinking. How can he forgive what would have left others in a padded cell for the rest of their lives? If your own brother has sold you to have you killed, how do you get over that? How, how, whatever you're sitting here with this morning, how do you get over it? I heard of an interesting custom this week, and it's kind of, I hope it's not too weird. Head shrinking. Head shrinking is they, they would shrink the skulls of their enemies and then they would hang them from their huts and they would do this so that they would remember that these are the people we hate and they are our enemies. Don't you ever forgive them was the purpose. And I'm, I meet so many people who name the name of Jesus Christ who are like this. And maybe the little skull is your dad. And it, I, I will never forgive him. He is my enemy my sworn enemy, till I die. And so what I want is a remedy for us this morning. And we're going to look at three things. Three things that Joseph tells his brothers to clear their conscience. Look with me. Uh, we're going to look in verse 19. <coughs> but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. And his first reason, for am I in God's place? My first point is don't sit in God's chair. Am I in God's place? Am I trying to be God? Am I going to hold anger and bitterness and resentment? Am I going to punish you for what you have done to me? Who has the knowledge to know what people really deserve except someone who knows everything like God? Who knows the motive of someone's heart? Who knows the background of how they were raised, what they've been under, what pressures they're facing today? Who, anyone but God, knows all of this to sit in this chair and bring revenge and retaliation or justice? Who knows what people deserve? Romans 12, God said, vengeance is mine. At my house, I've got this beautiful rocking chair. It's so comfortable, and it's dad's chair. And I don't know why I've tried to establish it. My kids love to get in it. And so every time I come home, it's just real simple. Get out of dad's chair. And there's always a few bold ones that I have to wrestle out of there, but most of them will just move. And bad illustration, but just get out of my chair is what Joseph God is saying. Don't get in my chair. You don't know what a person really deserves. You just don't. If somebody wrongs you, guys, you stand on a razor's edge. If you don't forgive, you are going to become evil yourself. The evil that they bring on you, if Joseph had not forgiven, he would have become the evil, bitter, nasty man that they came and brought upon him. So every time you're mistreated, you're on a razor's edge. Either you um, forgive or the evil itself will begin to permeate you and in your life. Nurse it, and you will be full of anger and bitterness and self-pity and self-absorption. I said to the, the group this morning, the fastest way to become like Satan is to try to become like God. And Joseph said, I am not in the seat of God. That's his business. 
and what freedom that could bring to some of your hearts this morning. Quit trying to be God and bringing the judgment and bringing the, the wrath and the punishment and the bitterness and all of those things. God alone sits in that seat and he really knows how to do it. You really can trust him to bring about making all things right. And so don't get in the seat of God. And, and he looks at his brothers. I'm not God. He'll, he'll deal with you guys. Look with me in verse 20 for a second reason then. And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So don't sit in God's chair, but do sit in his lap. That's the safe place. I would call this the Old Testament verse of Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who've been called according to his purpose. This has to get into our hearts or we will never be able to forgive or endure the hard providences that will come upon us in our lives. So you have to get this. This can't just be academic. Guys, we have to get this into our hearts. This is saying that God has incorporated man into his saving activities and they are used to further the objectives of God. And this is so radical in our day and age that God doesn't just stop evil. He uses it to accomplish the opposite of what evil wanted. That is the absolute sovereignty of God, that he rules and reigns over all and he has decreed your life from beginning to end. And here's Joseph sitting in it. And you say, Pastor, I just, I, it's always talking about theology here. I just want seven easy steps to get rid of stress. And that wouldn't have fixed Joseph. But what fixed Joseph was an absolute confidence in the sovereignty of God that you human instruments, you meant this for evil. But the sovereign God of the universe meant this for good to bring about a, a remnant that would be kept alive during this time of famine. I absolutely trust the hand of God. And so Joseph is saying, I don't have the right to retaliate in God's chair. And I don't, I don't have the need to retaliate because what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. You were God's instruments to bring about good, to preserve many people alive. This is Joseph sitting on Mount Everest and he can see his whole life now. And I don't think he was always there. But uh, we can, because we have more revelation than Joseph had. And we can sit on Mount Everest every day and be able to see it through the lenses of God because of the further revelation that we've received in this Bible. And so when we are in the valleys of life and we can't understand or see why, and there are many here today, we can open our Bibles and we can sit on this mountain and we can see what God is doing in our lives. And when I went to the Lord's Prayer, I told you there is no plan B for your life. There is not a plan B. Uh, such messed up lives. You, Jacob, I mean, that guy's life was a mess. And, and, you, and Abraham had a mess. And Joseph's family, the whole thing's toxic and, and falling apart. And so is this whole thing plan B? Well, I hate to tell you, Christ comes out of this line and it's perfectly set up and designed. That's plan A. Okay, Christ is plan A. And so I just want you to just get that you are on plan A no matter where you sit here this morning. Mistakes, hurts, shortcomings in the journey. It's all plan A to bring about good for the saving of many lives. That doesn't mean there wasn't sin on your behalf or others. They, they meant it for evil. There's sin to dealt, be dealt with and to work through. But I'm telling you that God uses everything to mold and to shape you in the image of Jesus Christ and even in the bigger plan of all that he's doing to sum up all things in Jesus Christ at the end of the age. Southside was birthed out of a, a great hurt that had been done to, to my own heart. Someone very, very close hurt me deep and it, it broke me really bad and I had to work through it. And I sit here today on the mountain totally free with great joy because what he meant for evil, God meant south side. And I can tell you right now, there's not even an ounce of bitterness. There's just a thank you, God. 
that you use this to start it with me on my face, broken, having to seek you and you alone. The human view of life divides and destroys, but God's view brings healing to hearts. So Joseph is not in denial. He is looking their evil square in the face. Can you find healing to your heart this morning on this holy ground? Can you take whatever it is that you've carried your whole life and can you look it right in the face this morning and bring it into, I'm not God. And what they meant for evil, God meant it for good in your life. Joseph is saying, all of this evil that you intended was to make me useful. Before I was self-absorbed and uh, you would bow down and worship me as now they're bowing down and worshiping him. But now through me, God has saved the lives of many. Is it possible for me? I've just run to depression. I've run to bitterness. I've run to a bottle. I've run to drugs. I've run to just cynicism. Could I really be delivered from this this morning? Could today be the end of a really bad journey? And I can say with a resounding, with God himself, yes, yes. Today could be the end. Here's the problem. One preacher said this. He said, great examples can really inspire you, can't they? Doesn't Joseph give you inspiration? He says, but then they crush you. Because they can't give you the power to make you like them. So you can look at Joseph and just, wow, that's beautiful. That, that, is, that is wonderful. And yet I, I can't forgive what that person did. And that's what I want to look at our last point. And we'll close out. In verse 21. So therefore, Joseph says, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and he spoke kindly to them. Our third point is Joseph was a mirror of God's love. Joseph experienced God's grace. And now he's manifesting it on those who hated him and sought to kill him. And so I want you to see that, that Genesis is a book about salvation. There's been a series of salvations. Noah, he, he was saved through the flood. Abraham was called out and saved through paganism. Jacob was saved from Esau. And now there's a family that has been saved from a famine that would have surely killed and destroyed them. But Genesis is not the ending. You know what the word means? It means beginning. These salvations that we see in Genesis, they're going to keep moving ahead. And they're going to keep moving ahead until we come to the Gospels. And we're going to see God's ultimate salvation now that he's going to bring about in Jesus Christ. And so I just want you to consider one thing. When you say, can I forgive like Joseph? Jesus said, you can do better. You can do better than Joseph. In Matthew 11, Jesus said, truly I say to you, <clears throat> among those born of woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I think all the prophets kept saying he's coming, he's coming. And John the Baptist said, there he is. And he's saying, now we have the fullness to present Jesus Christ. We have a, a, a union and a spirit dwelling within us. Uh, we can do greater things than Joseph. You get the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have a resource beyond any of the Old Testament saints. You have union with Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. And the greatest example of forgiveness and the empowering of forgiveness is the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And yet as we gaze at that cross, there's an empowering strength to say, Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. This is absolutely amazing. It produced people like Stephen as they were throwing rocks at him. Say, Father, forgive them. It brought out people like Corey Ten Boon with all that the, the Nazis had done to her family and all of the suffering, and it brought about forgiveness in her own heart. It brought about a family in her own church when they were driving one day and a, a man fell asleep and crashed into their car and killed their mother and their brother and hurt their sister and them greatly. 
And they wrote a letter to the man who did it, who fell asleep to say, we just want you to know we're Christians and we forgive you and we love you and we're, we're, try, we're doing anything we can to help. We have people who have forgiven parents of great harm and kids who have forgiven their parents and friends and even pastors. And there's a, there's a beautiful forgiveness that's flowing and the power of this gospel of Jesus Christ. And so would you lift your eyes this morning and I want you to look at a greater Joseph. Joseph was delivered over to his enemies by his own. He was delivered over by his own brothers. He suffered unjustly, yet his sufferings were used by God, he said, to bring about good, to preserve many people alive. And so as we move to the Gospels, we see that Jesus was rejected by his own family and he was rejected by his own people. They received him not. And he suffered greatly, had no place to lay his head. And he was arrested and he was not guilty, kind of like Joseph in prison. And in the garden, he was given a cup to drink and the enemies were making it and preparing it and he called it the Father's cup. He said, but you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So that through his sufferings, he would be saving many lives. Has there ever been a greater evil that's brought about a greater good than what Jesus did on that cross? There has never been a greater evil than killing the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Glory. And there's never been a greater good that has come out of such evil. Why we sit and celebrate today is that he's given us salvation in his name. If you would look at this and believe it, that he drank that cup for even you, even your sins. I want you to hear that this morning. Not just the sins of others, even your sins. He drank that cup of God's wrath so that you could be forgiven. And in that, you will become a forgiving person. It's just, it's the fruit. When you understand what Christ did and that now the Father forgives you of all your sins, the, the, the fruit that comes out of that knowledge is a forgiving spirit. It's just you stand in forgiveness. It's, it's who you are. It's the foundation of us. And I think you'll become unflappable as you look at the cross because ultimate evil was used to bring about ultimate good. I can trust that God is doing that in my life. No matter what I'm enduring, no matter what I have to go through, no matter how dark or bleak it looks this morning, he's working for our good and I can look at the cross and have no doubt but our specific and detailed lives and trials, God is preparing for you good works that only you can walk in. He's working in your life to prepare you for good works before the foundation of the world. There are some problems that only you can help. There are some bedsides that only you can go to. There are some good deeds that only you can do. And I pray that you can stand with Joseph and Paul and say, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and called according to his purpose. God is working in your life to bring about this good of being conformed to Christ, to use you for his kingdom that he is advancing. Every hurt, everything that you've had to face is the hand of God preparing you for good works that you should walk in them. Don't hate that hand. Love it. It's a father's hand. So I want to close with an illustration I heard this week. I really liked it. In the second scene in the Chronicles of Narnia, <coughs> Lucy sees Aslan, and she kisses and she buries her face in his mane. And he touches her with his tongue and his warm breath upon her. And she says, Aslan, you're, you're bigger. Is it because you're older? No, it's because you are. And every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And so I want to ask you, have you grown? Is he bigger? Is he bigger where his good purposes encompass all of your lives and you're growing to see more and more? When I was first saved, I got so little of it. And now I just marvel. I get to look at all your lives and my lives to just marvel at this hand of God. And all he's bigger than he's ever been. He just gets bigger and bigger with the more I grow and the more I see. What you meant for evil, 
This big God meant it for good. Amen? I love you guys. May he deliver anyone this morning that is caught in this bondage of this bitterness of not seeing the hand of God the way that you should. May he deliver us. Let's pray. Father, I do pray for any dear soul. I, I can't even begin to fathom how deep they can be hurt. God, there are so many things that can cut and they can, they can scar and hurt so deeply. But God, you have given us a remedy beyond even what Joseph had. God, you have given us the greater Joseph, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that every eye with every hurt that they would look it right in the eye this morning and not hide it. And they would lift it up and then they would look to the cross. And they would look at the one who was being killed and crucified in their place. And they would hear him say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. God, I pray that they would be able to forgive any wrong, any hurt, that even today that, that word means to release. I pray that they would release whoever has hurt them, that they would absorb the debt and they would release that person who has hurt them. God, let hands and hearts be opened up even here this morning. God, set them free from some who may have nurtured this for 50 years. God, let it be set free uh, this morning with the people of God looking at God. Lord, use this message, these truths of Joseph to, to, to rid their hearts of these bitterness and anger and all that's happened. Lord, I pray for the, for the rest, Lord, that you will continue to help us grow, to be able to be those who can see a larger God who's working and there's times, the, the times that were the darkest and the most confusing. We will look back on Mount Everest and we will see the deepest work of our God of all time. Lord, give us faith. Give us faith to see past the scene and the hardness of our trial to this good, invisible, sovereign hand that is working everything in our life for good. And when we come on that last day and we see it in all its glory, Lord, we will not say it was too hard. I regret it. We'll say, oh, I wish I would have run harder and not struggled so much. Oh, God, your wisdom is beyond finding out. Your goodness is beyond any that we've ever known. God, give us faith to trust this invisible hand and to be led and guided by it. Lord, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in that sweet, precious name that we, we pray and that we find forgiveness and we find a model and we find the empowerment to be these kind of men and women. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.